Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world today, a very warm welcome to our global audience for our first panel of Coursera Conference 2023. My name is Yusuf Tukhan, and I'm a senior solution consultant at Coursera, where I help translate our customers' strategic objectives into scalable, sustainable skill development programs. Through my work at Coursera, I speak to businesses all over the world about how their industries are changing. And the common theme that I hear from every business is that embracing digitalization and automation is no longer a choice that they have the luxury of ignoring. It's now an existential choice. And even the most analog businesses realize that in order to survive in this time of uncertainty, things have to change. And navigating this uncertainty is the challenge of the moment for learning leaders everywhere. As organizations rethink their talent strategy in a post-pandemic era, there's an opportunity to find new solutions to complex problems. One of the biggest challenges learning leaders face is the accelerating shift in the distribution of jobs and how quickly top skills are shifting for jobs overall, combined with the exponential growth of new technologies like generative AI and their potential for further disruption of every aspect of how we live and work. But in the face of these seismic shifts, the expectations for learning leaders haven't changed. They're still charged with building meaningful, impactful learning programs that drive business outcomes for the company's most strategic initiatives by prioritizing budgets and aligning skill development with their needs. They need to demonstrate the ROI of learning through effective measurement and prioritization of the most impactful learning outcomes. And they need to close the most critical skill gaps by creating urgency within their organizations and motivating employees to learn. And so creating these effective learning programs requires balancing a complete view of today in order to navigate to a more skilled tomorrow. And to better understand how to navigate this uncertainty and how to deliver successful and multidimensional skill development at scale, I'm delighted to welcome our accomplished panelists who lead skill development for two of the most iconic and digitally enabled organizations in the world. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Karina Montilla Edmonds. She's the Senior Vice President and Global Head of Academies and University Alliances at SAP, a multinational software corporation with offices worldwide. She's a globally recognized leader in the field of innovation, education, and technology transfer, and is passionate about education and providing career opportunities to underserved communities. Prior to joining SAP, Karina was the global lead for university alliances for cloud AI at Google, where her primary role was to facilitate research collaboration in AI between Google Cloud and academic researchers. She's also served as the executive director for corporate partnerships at Caltech, as a director for technology transfer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and has also served in the Obama administration, where she was appointed as the first technology transfer coordinator in the US Department of Energy. I'd also like to welcome Daniela Proust, who is a senior vice president and head of global learning and growth at Siemens, where she's responsible for the learning and development experience and for fostering individual growth at scale for over 300,000 learners globally. She's a highly experienced global strategy and learning and development leader, with a de demonstrated record of designing and implementing successful transformations and organizational development strategies. She's been with Siemens since 2008 and has held a number of roles overseeing compliance, stakeholder engagement, customer experience, and education strategy. Daniela considers careers that, as option rooms and is passionate about innovation and technologies that contribute to the sustainable development of societies. So welcome to you both. We're very lucky to have you here. But before we dive in, I just want to say to the audience that we welcome engagement from all of you. So please do ask questions for our panelists in the QA tab on your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as we can as we go through our panel today. So Daniela, Karina, welcome. It's great to have you here. But before, um, what I want to talk about first is really designing learning strategies for these vast learner populations. Um, Daniela, maybe I can start with you. I mean, you lead the strategy for Siemens to deliver learning to 300,000 employees around the world who work across a range of industries, disciplines, geographies. How do you build a learning framework that enables core competency development and, ma and marry that with the complexities of functional skills, technical skills, and regional knowledge? Thank you for the question. And uh, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, it's really great to be with everyone today. And also, I'm really very happy and thankful to have an exchange with you, Yusuf and Karina. I'm sure it's going to be really exciting. <laughs> Thank you. So the question uh, you are asking sounds very easy. It's not so easy to do, I can say. <laughs> so Siemens is, as you said, a very complex uh, company. We are active in various industries. So you can think about that we uh, develop uh, trains, for instance, 
or that we connect grid infrastructure with buildings, or uh, in another example that we completely build um, digital factories and a lot in between. So it's it's a huge variety of what the company is, is bringing as value to our customers and society at large. So therefore, a learning framework or a framework to bring learning and career development to uh, a diverse range of topics to all people across the world means that we had to disruptively shift our overall strategy, how we approach learning and career development. You were so nicely saying in the in the entry statement that I think of careers as, as option rooms. That's very true. And that is at the core of the strategy. If you think of careers as option rooms, they obviously are highly individual. So people come with a backpack full of skills, knowledge, experiences, and everyone has a different backpack. But therefore, also the learning needs and what is then relevant to build as a skill or a competence is highly individual too. So a key word here is personalization, flexibility, scalability, and it has to dynamically change on a continuous basis. So that, as I said, sounds maybe easy. It's really not so easy to do. And mm -hmm. our solution to that is that we embarked on developing something that we call a platform-based learning ecosystem. So connecting learning with the learners across a broad range of topics, as you said, technical skills, functional skills, technology topics, market topics, or things that everybody needs, like communication and languages, so that everybody can pick and choose the individual tailored subset that is relevant to him or her at the moment of need, enabled through technology. And I'm sure we will explore that a bit uh, during our mm -hmm. conversation, how that then really comes to life and how we how we design it. Yeah, it's it's incredibly, incredibly complex. And and Karina, if I can come to you, I mean, your remit not only covers internal learners, but also external learners within your sort of global ecosystem of partners and, and so on. What, what's that like? Maybe tell us a bit more about how you manage that and maybe how do you address the similar challenge of managing so many skill skill requirements. Sure. So it's interesting to to listen to Daniela because I think we have a very similar approach in terms of um, sort of having more of a modular learning platform where it's um, more uh, easily consumable uh, for folks. So I should also mention that um, I have a colleague that sort of has Daniel's uh, role at SAP, uh, Max Russell, who leads um, SAP Learning for our really focus on our internal. Um, under academies and university alliances, I have a more external focus of how do we um, train SAP professionals globally. And we have, I'm fortunate to have the support of a um, 3000 plus academic community out there that teaches SAP in the classroom, which is wonderful. But um, we're also looking to see how do we make SAP available in broader platforms. So obviously our partnership with Coursera last, this year has been great and we're looking to continue to grow that. But what we try to do is meet learners where they are and um, provide the resources and the assets that they need to get to where they wanna be. So that when they have these option rooms, right? And opportunities um, to grow their careers, um, they have those skills that they need. And really we see this as a continuous process. You know, even now when I talk to students, they ask me, what should I learn? What should I major in? And I go, learn to learn. This mm -hmm. is this is the name of the game. You know, uh, we will all, all our skills will be outdated unless we're continually, continuously growing and learning. And so um, that's really what we focus on. How can we continue to provide folks opportunity for growth, whether it be for um, career progression, engagement, just, um, you know, uh, per, some purpose-driven um, learnings, right? Um, I love, we, we have these challenges um, internally as well. At SAP, we call micro-learning and empathy and inclusion and, you know, just those soft skills as well that are uh, so critical, obviously, in the uh, post-COVID age. Yeah, it, it's interesting with the soft skills piece, you know, because I think so much focus is, of course, on the digital skills that we all need today. But if we think about how disruptive a lot of these new technologies are being today, especially things like ChatGPT, which can talk like a human and do a lot of these things. What I find interesting is that for the first time, you know, almost in human history, we've suddenly stopped talking about why humans are important because we're so smart, but now suddenly saying, oh, we're, we're important because we have all these human qualities and communication qualities. And 
I think that maybe that's something interesting we can explore to understand like, is that shift taking place? Because we're obviously all running away with the importance of digital skills, but how do we balance that with human skills as well? Well, if I could just jump in, I, I will say, you know, I think this really uh, came to a head during COVID where, mm. you know, um, we were all uh, forced to be a little, first, a little more empathetic towards everyone <laughs> um, and and being in that boat. But I definitely, and just the importance of, of human communication, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I, can't, I couldn't agree more that these soft skills are becoming more and more important and, you know, funny that you should mention, yeah, that with ChatGBT, that that's, you know, it's our reasoning skills, our um, ethical compass um, <laughs> that is really now highlighted in the decisions yeah. that we can make as humans. Um, and so yeah. I'll let Danielle jump in. Daniela. Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on. It is obviously super important and super critical to develop soft skills further. When I see what was kind of the focus um, over the last two to three years, some of the top topics were uh, virtual collaboration. So how to now adjust to, to this very digital world and how to at the same time connect, how also to lead uh, virtually teams that are spread across the world. And then a lot of things around critical thinking, systems thinking, collaboration in general. So these were kind of top of the list of what our learners were interested in learning, particularly also leaders, because I think we all have seen a significant change in the role of leaders uh, across the digital transformation that is going on every, uh, everywhere. So yeah. these topics are really spot on and it they obviously usually come in conjunction with functional or technical topics. And then there is then the sweet spot to find for each person, you know, what makes sense in the context of the role yeah. of the team of the, the area you work in. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful. Um, what I would also maybe like to explore a bit further is, you know, kind of how we, you know, we talked a bit about kind of creating that marketplace and that platform and how we get people to learn. But maybe, maybe Karina, if I can turn to you, just talk a bit about off-platform learning. You know, at Coursera, you know, we often say to our customers that we're most effective when we're part of a wider integrated program of learning, which includes on-the-job training. And so how do you extend that experience beyond digital learning and, you know, learning online? Sure, yeah, and that's a great question. Like I said, um, with COVID, we find out, um, how, you know, virtual work works really well, but nothing replaces the human uh, to human um, yeah. connection and experience. So we actually have a number, and again, through SAP Learning, we have actually a, a premium offering for in classroom learning. Um, besides the 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 students, these are for our partners and customers as well. Um, hybrid learning um, opportunities as well, um, mm -hmm. where people can come in, whether it be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, we have people that can obviously do the work um, on their own time, but then come in at a weekly time. So we do have classroom instruction. We even have in-person instruction. Um, part of my purview is uh, I have, I oversee two academies at SAP. We have a sales academy and an engineering academy, both based in San Ramon, California where um, obviously during COVID, we were gone virtual and we're really excited this year to um, be bringing folks back into the office. And I can tell you the excitement um, is really palatable there. Uh, everyone is super excited to come in. And even if, you know, we've made some adjustments, uh, so uh, a little shorter time frame um, for that in-person interaction, but everyone recognizes, especially like I myself, when I go to meetings now where I see, I was at a student event yesterday and you just get so energized from seeing yeah. people. It's such a simple thing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny because I was like, this is what we used to do, but now it's like so new and novel and exciting. Yeah. So um, it really does um, raise the level of engagement, I feel, mm -hmm. and what you learn and that network. Because a lot of part of that of learning is networking, right? And learning that peer-to-peer yeah. -peer learning um, is really important. And I think it's, you know, optimal when you're in person. Like I said, we can do it virtually and some combination of that um, mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, works best, I think, for folks, especially because people have gotten used to the flexibility of, yeah. you know, learning on their own time or, you know, being able to do it when they can do it. Um, so, yeah, we, this is what we do. We, we do a, a wide range 
of um, offerings from, like yeah. I said, in person, virtual to hybrid. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. I mean, because it feels really premium suddenly, doesn't it? You know, it feels really valuable where before, like, work training was just something we all did, but suddenly the chance to travel, to meet, take a few days away from the daily grind and really focus on what you're doing. Like you said, build those connections, build those relationships is, is really powerful. Yeah, and if I, can, if I can just share, you know, just early mm -hmm. March, um, my team, we had um, the UConn, which is a university community kickoff. And I, it was like for months, I'm still getting posts on LinkedIn of the faculty, how, in, how valuable, I mean, what I had one faculty, like every interaction I had was extremely valuable. You know, just the takeaways, the uh, learning from each other um, was just insane. And like I said, I, yeah. it's a month later and I'm still getting thank you notes or I'm seeing <laughs> posts on LinkedIn and I, it's just been amazing. And everything. just to be there in person to, to pick up on that energy um, yeah. was really special. It must be great. And, and Daniela, I imagine you have a similar kind of challenge with your team, because I imagine people can learn a lot of things in person, but I imagine there's some very big, very complex, very hands-on roles that people need to do to take maybe take what they learn maybe digitally and maybe apply it in the real world and build real world skills as well. Absolutely. And I think the platforms, um, our platform is called My Learning World. That is what comes to life to all our people and is like a single point of entry to learning. It comes as a, I would say, digital first experience, but it then has in its belly and in all the learning opportunities, a wealth of different mm, formats, methods, and, and all of it combined. And there, for me, the, the magic word is relevance and orientation. Uh, so we try to support our people the best way possible that they can navigate, that they can orient themselves and find what is most relevant to them. And um, as we were discussing, it can be at the moment of need, that is often the case, but obviously you also need more structured longer term programs that accompany a certain development towards a role to make a new shift into something that you are embarking on. And yeah. um, therefore the modularization is super key. At the same time, you also need some structure and something like a red thread that people know how to, to best navigate different things in combination. And for me, that also combines physical experiences, but there we are very, um, I would say conscious about where we really focus on, on physical interaction, on person meetings, which, which often is then about really making connections, meeting people, or when you want to, to create certain innovative things, uh, creative things, there it's very meaningful to combine also physical experiences. Uh, yeah. Usually it's then a hybrid kind of combination that works like in a learning path way, where then also certain elements are in person um, integrated and people love yeah. it. I think yeah. that, that's the key. People love it. And I have one key statement that I would like to make because I think it's really important. I think also people follow people. And what I see is that we have more than 700 curators. So it's experts all over the company that kind of curate learning opportunities for their audience whom they know quite well, their communities. And their people are super engaged because they know, oh, this person is the guru in AI. I'm gonna follow him and I'm, I'm really gonna do the things that he's recommending because oh, wow. I know that he's the guru. So you can work with a lot of um, those means of influencing people and navigating at the same time. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it's almost like using them almost as influencers within your organization to let people yeah. know what's trending, what's what's hot and so on. But I imagine, you know, building skills, you know, in project management at Siemens, for example, takes a lot more than just doing a course in project management. Like, how do you stretch people to really manage, not just project management, project management on a, on a Siemens scale? Yeah, it's a very interesting example indeed, because project management as a term is probably relevant to almost everyone. Yeah. to a different level of depth and understanding, right? So we have obviously some general project management courses, but then we also have a dedicated function where we develop very senior project managers that lead, for instance, large infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. One example is we are at the moment building a new train infrastructure that, com that connects all Egypt from the oh, wow. north to the south. To lead a project like that, 
you know, you need really to be a, a strong expert. It's such a complex topic to do. So there yeah. we have several programs that in maturity come over the years and that have very strong certifications in the backpack of it. Yeah. And there, back to your previous point, there is also a combination of, let's say, knowledge transfer of, of gaining skills, but also it's combined with practical experience, with project work, with stretch assignments, with mentoring and coaching. So it's a combination of different things that come together to help this person uh, to be able to lead a project yeah. like that in the end. Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's incredible. I can only imagine what it takes to manage train infrastructure um, at that scale. It's certainly bigger than the websites I used to project manage when I was younger. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about return on investment, because I know that's a topic that's very dear and, and very important to a lot of our audience today. Um, you know, and Daniela, circle back to you. I mean, for many in our audience, you know, providing this measurable ROI to their investment and learning is key, especially in a time of cost cutting, pessimistic market outlooks. So how do you measure that value of investment and learning? Because this is something that I think a lot of people would like, like to learn more about. Yeah, I must say, I would be curious about what Karina says. We have mm. not found the golden uh, bullet or the holy grail yet. We measure a lot of um, data points, KPIs, that in combination give us a lot of insight. Um, we consider learning as an invest in our people so that our mm -hmm. business can be successful and future fit. So for us, yeah. it's not a cost, it's an invest. It's a very conscious decision. And then obviously you can have KPIs around how learning hours, how much has been learned, participations, engagement, feedback, all of that you can do on a global level. Yeah. When it goes more towards impact, we do that more specifically than almost on a program level. Because yeah. what success then means is very different for a safety program or a project management program or a program for salespeople, you know, and then also what kind of change behavior and knowledge you want to see in application yeah. is very different. That is why we have, we call it our T model. We have some global generic KPIs and then for certain programs, we go very deep in defining what, what success means. Mm. That's interesting because I guess, yeah, trying to define success for 300,000 different people is a lot more challenging than identifying <laughs> this sector, this team, this functional unit, and so on. Um, Karina, it sounds like you have a similar challenge, but also supporting external learners as well in sales and engineering with very different measurements of, of the impact that your learning can provide for them. Yeah, sure. So obviously some roles are easier than others, but, you know, ultimately, um, as Daniela mentioned, we also see learning as an investment in our people. And success is really rooted in learning. And, um, you know, there's a lot of data to show that happy employees, engaged employees uh, are more productive and ultimately, you know, drive profits, right? And so um, there are those areas of um, that we um, poll employees every year in terms of, of engagement, right? Um, so there are these return on investments that are not measurable. Some roles, yes, like I said, we have a sales academy. So that's that can that's easily measurable, but um, really overall, as you look at just employees across the board, it's that opportunity to to be engaged. I think really to me that's a big driver on yeah. return on investment, right? Um, career opportunities, career growth, right? How are they progressing? Um, yeah. Career progression, I think, is is a, is a big one for us. Um, so you know, those those are the things of you know they're not entirely tangible I feel yeah. um, so and it's hard because I'm an engineer so we of course we want to measure everything um, yeah. but but yeah definitely and, and you see it um, like I said the opportunity for for growth and um, and just and, and continuous learning and yeah and again that can that happens in, in many ways at SAP um, and just providing like I said I I just, it's almost overwhelming. So I think yeah. uh, Daniel mentioned how, you know, you can guide. I often get recommendations. We think, you know, this training might be of interest to you. But I, I'll also mention, we have this amazing um, SEP community that I believe has something like 3 million learners a month. Wow. And this, it's uh, 20 years, it, it just celebrated its 20th year. This is a global community of both internal and external. Um, and that is, again, there um, where we have these influences 
influencers as well that yeah. um, really are offering um, learning opportunities um, on different topics across the board. Of course, chat GPT right now is, is a hot topic uh, yeah. for us as it is uh, for most companies. Um, but yeah, there's, like I said, uh, some roles are easier to measure this ROI, but really I think um, employee engagement, inclusion and content are, are really uh, key drivers um, yeah. ultimately. No, yeah. No, it, it sounds good. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because it just feels like everybody knows they need it. And it's almost like, you know, it's not negotiable in terms of the need to invest. But like you said, it can be quite hard to tag those, to bring those together. Um, that's really helpful. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, um, Karina, is around talent pipelines, because you talked about the size of the ecosystem, the size of the audience. And obviously, for a lot of businesses like yours, they need to have really strong digital talent. You know, it can't be overstated in terms of engineering, in terms of sales and a lot of other aspects. And so, you know, beyond, you know, kind of the standard recruitment that, that, SAP, that, that SAP does, how do, you build, how do you build that talent pipeline for people who can join that organization? Do you partner with people outside of SAP to develop that talent and, and, and maybe facilitate that for them as well? Sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. First of all, we have a huge challenge because we are expecting something like 500 roles to be... Um, to come online through from our ecosystem in the next couple of years. So it's a big challenge. And That's we're seeing role. it from like our customers. Don't from, exist yet. Yes, exactly. Wow. And and yeah, roles, yeah, for SA skilled uh, labor. So it's it's I'm excited because I see so many opportunities um, for students and just for individuals with SAP skills. Like I get this all the time. I was just traveling, um, you know students who say as soon as they put SAP on their um, resume, they get a job, they get a call, they get an interview. So it's, it's really want, a wonderful opportunity to have. But yes, so we can't do it alone. First, our partnership with Coursera, great start for people who just want to learn about SAP and get on that path for SAP certification. We're also looking at non-traditional four-year colleges. I mentioned we have this amazing academic community but we also partner recently with 42 schools, 42 Berlin, 42 Prague. 40, for those that may not know, 42 school is a um, a peer to, a project-based peer-to-peer learning organization. And I um, and you know these students are coming out with you know the equivalent of a software degree, software developers, and are being hired right out of that um, mm -hmm. out of that program. We work with veterans. The other piece um, I'm also personally pers personally passionate about and in the U.S. We work with um, HBCUs, historically black colleges and university minority serving institutions as well. Because as we grow that pipeline, we want to do it in a gender neutral way and mm -hmm. a you know um, diverse way um, with diverse candidates. So whatever we can do, again, um, in Canada, I think we just recently rolled out. Um, a program to remove the bachelor's um, requirement, which I believe a lot of companies are looking at as well. So again, just really um, broadening our um, our pipeline of talent, you know, and, and me first preparing that talent wherever they are, like I said, not just on the academic route, but non-traditional routes as well. Yeah. So that's that's been exciting. And we're continuing yeah. to grow that. It's, it's great. And, and you're... And you're and your passion for that is, is, is coming through very clearly. So it, it's wonderful to hear. Um, Daniela, I imagine you probably have a similar challenge in terms of attracting talent um, to Siemens. Are you doing something similar with the external audiences? Yeah, I think pipeline and talent development um, is a broad topic. And obviously, there is not one single strategy to that. So we have our own Siemens professional education. So we have our own training centers and do professional education in, in certain professions. Um, that is for a certain part, then our internal um, talent pipeline, particularly for the, for the factory environment or for service and, and maintenance um, colleagues. Um, then we also have dual study programs. Um, we work with a lot of universities um, where I find this combination of practical experience and making a degree at the same time um, mm. a very successful model for Siemens. Um, also these people, I have, for instance, five master students myself at the moment in my team. 
and uh, it is great to see how they how they learn, grow, and create also innovation in our own team just by, you know, bringing influence from their studies, from their interchange that they have with other students. So these are elements that we do, and then obviously through hiring, it's a it's a big topic that you attract the the yeah. relevant pockets uh, of of segments and talents that you that you need and that you you want to win for your company mm. and then also to retain them so that obviously is a much broader topic in itself because we are a very large organization and we are hiring so many people every year yeah. and we also want to foster internal mobility so also we want people to move around more than probably a few years ago people would have yeah. done so all of these elements come together. So obviously we have talent development programs. We also have spe special talent programs, pipeline programs. That is something we do centrally and decentrally in the markets yeah. and in the respective businesses, because usually they also know best what they need and uh, yeah. what kind of talent they want to attract, which roles they want to fill. Yeah. And then I think one one key element is that luckily, like SAP, we have a very strong employer brand. So yeah. Siemens is recognized as a very good company to work for. We have a strong purpose that people uh, engage in a lot because we create a, a difference in society through technology. Yeah. So that in itself is very helpful that you can win the talent that you that you want to win. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I, I, it comes back almost to those intangibles in terms of the value of learning in some ways. You know, I think being that employer brand that's recognized as somebody who invests in their people, invests in talent, must be something on, on top of your minds, you know, when, when attracting and, and recruit, retaining new talent as well. So if I could just add, you know, um, yeah. Daniela, um, jog my memory there on the retention piece. I think that's another really important indicator of return on investment for learning, you know huge on, on retention so I just wanted to mention that but I, I couldn't agree more on that piece no I think I think it's really powerful um and maybe maybe Karina if I can turn to you um talk a bit about driving engagement you know because I think for so many of the customers interestingly for us you know kind of three years into the pandemic a lot of them now are kind of you know two or three years into their kind of new learning strategy where there's a lot of online learning and so on but key to a lot of this really is continuous engagement with learners and building that culture of learning and I'd just love to hear kind of how SAP creates that culture of learning, the campaigns, themes, programs, you know, how do you keep people learning? Yeah, so a couple of ways. So one, I want to talk about engagement with, again, the, the community that I serve, the academic community. We find that bringing real life challenges into the classroom is one of the best ways to engage students, especially when we went virtual. I mean, not, nothing captures the imagination of a student than a real life challenge. And when we yeah. can do that around sustainability and those um, topics that are near and dear to their heart. Increasingly, as you, as I'm sure we're all aware, we see data, Gen Z is really purpose-driven. They're looking to work for a company that has a purpose that they can relate to. And just like Siemens, I feel very fortunate to be at SAP um, yeah. with our purpose to make, you know, improve people's lives. Um, yeah. And so that that's one. Um, engaging um, gamification is a great way um, to engage um I believe our colleagues in learning some friendly competition, right? So we have these micro learnings where you can get awards and, and badges and things like this. Um, and I think that's really helpful and useful. So wherever we can bringing in, like I said, uh, the gamification piece, um, we actually have SAP, we have ERP SIM, which we play not just with, uh, with students, but customers and partners um, can get in and really learn about, you know, also our, our new products and services um, through that. And again, bringing in those components. So recently, like I said, um, our ERP SIM game, we're now bringing in sustainability components to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think gamification is a great way, right? We haven't even gotten into um, the virtual reality and different ways, right, that we can deliver learning. That's something that we're, we're um, exploring within our academies as well. Yeah. How do you bring in um, AR, VR um, to that learning, uh, especially yeah. as, as we, went, we we pivoted to virtual and we're, yeah. we're keeping those components as well. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? It just feels like not just in our kind of personal lives, but even in our work lives, our expectation of what a good digital experience feels like has gone from here to here. 
and suddenly everything needs to be good as Netflix and Amazon <laughs> when we interact with it. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on all of us in the ecosystem to deliver great experiences. Um, Daniela, I'd love to hear from you. I'm sure you know you've got a lot of things on on your agenda across your global audience in terms of how you're building driving engagement. Yeah, absolutely. And building on what Karina said, I think a few of the keywords she already mentioned, like um, gamification or different experiences that are very engaging, like simulations or adaptive learning or virtual reality use cases. I think the, the formats and methods is, is a key element. Then the incentivization, as she was mentioning, like certification badges, credits, whatever it then would be. Because at the end of the day, people also want to work, to ensure their sustainable employability, right? So yeah. if they have something in their hand that then also shows that they have gained a certain expert level at something is very meaningful. Yeah. And then the whole thing of it had to be fun, you know, mm -hmm. you have you can work with winning awards or, you know, do a competition or and that also sometimes is culturally very different. Yeah. Uh, I just um, learned from, from my team in China. We had a China learning day and there they did a sales pitch competition per video and the people loved it. You know, in, in Germany, I would do a, a different thing probably. So culturally, yeah. you also have to see what fits and how to engage the people. Ultimately, I think people are by nature curious. So what I try to do with all that we do is to ignite a passion for learning and to spark curiosity to see, oh, these things are not just boring and painful, but actually they are useful, helpful, and fun. And yeah. there is a value in it for me as a person as well, and also obviously for the company as a whole. And I think that at the end of the day is quite uh, a journey. It would probably never <laughs> be finished, I believe, because there is so much innovation going on in the space that is that we have to you know, keep, the, keep up the pace with. Yeah, it's, but it's, I think it's a combination it's, of all of it. Yeah. And in addition, uh, when we started on this learning strategy to, to bring to life a platform-based learning ecosystem, we created at the same time an own communication campaign, which we call My Growth. It is very employee-centric. It is very nudging. It is deliberately playing with mistakes. So, for instance, you, you we know you write a word and then you cross out a, a letter that is wrong. And yeah. uh, we do that in, in order to influence mindset and behavior of our people that they engage in the things that we are bringing there as an opportunity to each and yeah. every. And it brings a bit of humanity to, to what can feel like a very yes. large, very it's impersonal experience. It's not so corporate, top, top down gray. <laughs> it's very <laughs> colorful and very playful. No, I, I think that's great. And I, I mean, it, you've, you've given us so much to think about. You've also given the audience a lot to think about today. So maybe I can turn it to a couple of questions. Um, that we could ask. And, you know, really maybe to, to both of you, you know, kind of one of the questions is kind of saying, as employers, do SAP and Siemens feel that universities are helping develop the right skills and are they doing their jobs? Yeah, um, I can start. Um, we, we work together um, with them um, on developing the curriculum um, that, and, you know, we're constantly innovating as well. And so, you know, as we move to the cloud, our curriculum is moving to the cloud as well. And so having that transition, um, in our case, like I said, we we work um, closely with faculty to deliver. So there, there's that piece um, of students that are graduating with the SAP skills that I needed. But um, outside of that, um, you know, I, I guess that there's, there's some question about that. Um, we love the project base. I actually think we are moving um, in the right direction. There's a lot more project based learning. These soft skills are coming in. I don't think there was such an emphasis right on collaborating and working together. And of course, you always had team projects, but I really do think there's more emphasis on collaboration. We have a number of design thinking workshops where obviously students come in um, together to to work on a solution. So, yeah. um, like I said, we're fortunate that we do have this community that we work with um, to yeah. make sure that we're getting the, um, the SAP skill talent that we need. We don't have enough and we're constantly needing to grow that. Um, yeah. But that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, sounds like it. How about you, Daniela? Hmm. 
It's a very interesting question. And for us, it's probably a multi-layered uh, answer. We work with a lot of universities, uh, think tanks, research institutes across the world. And I think with different strategies and mechanisms. So obviously we have collaborations for the dual study programs or for our professional education, where we, like, like you just said, uh, also support the, the continuous development and evolution of curricula that are also quite strict because you have bodies that are governing those yeah. right so there we are more in an in innovation driver to adjust these formal apprenticeship programs for instance to make sure that they fit into into the the world of today in a factory yeah i think that, that is a lot of value for for society for the students but obviously also for Siemens, if we can get those graduations um, right, that they fit for yeah. purpose. Then we yeah. have research collaborations that are super interesting. We have some key universities across the world with whom we develop uh, new technologies, you know, innovation, cooperation, partnerships. It's not so much the talent focus, but I find it's a yeah. very important and interesting point um, that goes beyond because there, obviously, you have then also access to people that are studying, I don't know, engineering at MIT or, yeah. uh, I don't know, IT at MIT. And so you you, you can work, as, uh, as we just heard, on projects, but also to foster innovation and make those students already part of developing innovation. I think that is a powerful one. Yeah. And, and are you finding more of an emphasis on things like industry micro credentials? You know, I mean, SAP, you know, we've got a great example on our platform now, but mm -hmm. are you finding these things where maybe people can deep skill for six months in something like project management, data analysis, UX? You know, do you think do you find a lot, a lot of value or, or increasing value in these micro credentials as well? I think yes. And I think it's 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 an early discussion. I think we will see a lot of change and transformation in the education sector in general over the years to come. And I think there's no one size fits all answer. I think you need also some, some foundational um, degrees because you need you, for some areas. And then yeah. for some areas, it's quite specific and micro credentials are much more flexible to dynamically adjust to the role that you then want to take as a next step yeah. or, or that you engage in. So probably the truth is, it needs it all yeah. and it has mm -hmm. to fit for purpose and into the context of the role and, and the individual. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. Um, well, another question, and, and I'm getting asked a few questions in a similar vein, really is around, you know, helping re leaders recognize what digital transformations are working at their institutions. I think obviously digital transformation is the buzzword everywhere. We're all talking about it. But how do lead learning leaders today, you know, some of the ones that, you know, in our audience today, how do learning leaders really identify what digital transformation means to their organization, what skills they need and, and how they get there. I, if I can just jump in, I mean, it's a continuous process and it's not an easy process of looking at what the skill sets are today and those that are needed in the future. Um, mm -hmm. There's definitely a lot of studies that have identified a mismatch of something like up to 55% of many companies of in terms of the current skills versus um, skills that are needed in the future, but, um, you know, are you, you know, ultimately profitability, right? Um, employee engagement, there are some great indicators of, of what's happening, but I just think it's, it's not an easy answer and it's, um, mm -hmm. going to be, you know, very specific to the company and the products and the services and where they are in that journey, right? It's, it's, it's a journey. So where are they in the journey? Are they, you know, had they started and did that journey start before after COVID, right? Which I do think yeah. every, it's just gotten accelerated at every level for everyone. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it's hard to say. Um, for us, we're, we're having great success because we're seeing it as we move our customers to the cloud. Um, yeah. that's, that's been you know, our, our target there. Um, but like I said, I think it's very specific to co the company, but we're excited that we have a, that platform to help companies move yeah. in, their in that digital um, transition. And so, and, and yeah. what we've been doing is uh, making offerings at every, you know, for every size company um, that people can, we just rolled out a new um, grow with SAP. 
Um, we have Rise with SAP and now we have Grow for SAP for even smaller yeah. companies, which has been um, really exciting to see um, the the market adoption uh, for yeah. that. So yeah, I don't think it's an easy question. It's, it's not, and I think it's really nice to see companies like SAP really being enablers of that transformation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Daniela, we've got a digital transformation course on Coursera from Siemens. Um, you know, so clearly you've done your bit in terms of maybe helping some of our audience um, learn a bit more, but I'd love to hear more about how you see it and what advice you may practically have for some of the learning leaders on the call today. Yeah, obviously it's a huge topic. I think that, uh, that we are all dealing with uh, in different ways. So we were embarking on setting the stage and setting the tone top down. So one nice thing about a platform-based ecosystem is that you, you have, in our case, 120,000 learning opportunities for our people that they can pick and choose. But it also enables us targeted steering. So in addition to that, let's say, more bottom-up or pull demand-driven approach, we also set topics that we think are highly relevant across the company. Mm -hmm. where we want to create a common language, common understanding. And uh, we did the first one of those on actually applying digitalization to your business. That's how the program was called. Mm -hmm. And we started at the top of the house with our top leaders. And then we um, trickled it further down through an e-learning to reach more than 40,000 people in the company. And that worked on very specific use cases of the respective businesses. And we started at the top of the house because we wanted to engage with the very senior leaders of the company to really make up their mind. So what does digital transformation mean in my context? Again, I think maybe one of the words today is context because yeah. it's different in industries for mobility or for other industries, right? So yeah, um, that was very powerful. And then... Mm -hmm. The next step of the journey was that we realized we are developing ourselves massively and are undergoing a major transformation ourselves as a company because we, we want to combine and connect the physical and the digital world. We are coming yeah. as a heritage from a, a technology manufacturing background, highly uh, motivated engineers that build beautiful solutions, physical ones though in the yeah. past. And now we bring the layer of digitalization into it and we connect all the knowledge that we have on industry know-how with the cloud services and make sure that the digital and physical world needs. And that means also our people need to understand platforms, how to work in ecosystems, how different business models then work and need to be applied, how you manage value chains differently if you have an ecosystem approach. So that was then the next program that we developed, which was called Leading in Business Ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Again, to create a common language, understanding why it's relevant to the company and also for everyone to try and um, you know, do some exercises around what does it mean for me in my function, my region, my business. Yeah. But I think it's, it's powerful and uh, a lot yeah. of opportunity for everyone. <laughs> it, 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 there really is so much opportunity. And it's interesting because one of the things, you know, we often talk about with our customers when it comes to the recipe for success is that need for executive sponsorship, executive engagement. And hearing you, Daniela, talk about, you know, really working with the leadership to understand what is it you actually want? What does this actually look like? And then finding ways to cascade that down through the organization, I think is really powerful. And, you know, I'd love to hear from both of you, you know, how are you, kind of building that cultural learning through executive sponsorship, through role modeling by setting those examples, but also making sure that those messages are cascaded very clearly. Because like we said, digital transformation can mean so much to so many different people. Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, it, it's definitely a culture that has to be supported at every level. So we um, started, you know, a couple of years ago, we have um, a people day, where it's really dedicated to learning and growing and identifying um, professional development. You know, we've really uh, both professional, yeah, uh, and development goals that we have um, around learning. Uh, for me and my organization, we make sure that we have development goals for every one of our colleagues on the on the learning front. Um, and like I said, it's it's modeled um, from our board. Um, all the way uh, down to, to everyone and giving folks opportunities um, to move up in that, you know, in, in the career progression. 
So, yeah. you know, um, whatever you're doing, you can set your sights on, on higher goals. And in supporting, we have um, internally, we have a, a catalyst program um, where we provide additional training to um, those folks that are mm -hmm. really excelling in their current roles. Mm -hmm. um, we have programs to support um, female leaders, um, you name it. So we, we, you know, we, besides these communities, what are the um, assets and learning opportunities that are needed? Um, but I think modeling is really important. And I feel yeah. that, um, you know, our leaders at SAP are, are doing it. And we have so many leadership trainings that I take advantage of. In fact, like I said, sometimes it's overwhelming because we have so much. And I think that's, yeah. that's a challenge um, of, you know, understanding, curating those opportunities so that you're not yeah. overwhelmed. And, um, and, you know, I've, it's hard, but I try to, to yeah. set some time every day, every week um, to, to have an opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah, that's great. I think that's, that's the best thing we can do, like you said, is to set that example for others. Um, Danielle, I'd love to hear about how, how you approach this as well. Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. It's Obviously, you need the tone from the top and the importance that is conveyed that, first of all, learning is important or the topic that you want to bring into the organization and you want to be understood um, is, is set strategically. Often it starts with things like having a common understanding of what you talk about. I really realize that definitions, it sounds maybe a bit boring, but is super important. For instance, when you think about ecosystems and you ask three people, you will get three different answers of what an ecosystem is. So we then wanted to create a common understanding of how we understand it and what the paradigms are that are so different to other um, let's say forms of, of traditional business models. Yeah. yeah. And if you have that common language, then uh, it enables to drive innovation. It enables to then implement different business models because people right away understand what you're talking about. So, and that obviously comes then through a different um, combination of means. So it's the, the, the top, setting the tone top down, having role models as we heard, using influencers, communities, ambassadors, whatever then makes sense for, for the topic you want to convey. And yeah. then it's a combination of learning, but also application and usually communication measures. And what I see at Siemens, leaders play a huge role. Often we, we also take a lot of time and invest to align certain topics um, for all our leaders, which is many. It's more than 22,000 leaders that we have in the company, but they wow. are a catalyst for us to reach all our people so yeah. we see that as a huge opportunity that when we invest there in a common understanding of our leaders we will influence and cascade to the whole organization yeah that, that that's great and to be honest the, the questions keep coming from from the audience um, unfortunately we're running out of time um so i get to ask one last question before we wrap up um to me really to ask both of you you know what are you most excited about in the year ahead you know with all the challenges but also all the opportunities ahead you know, what are you most excited about in terms of what you're going to be doing or what Siemens or SAP are doing over the next 12 months from a learning perspective? I can start. Um, of course, like I said, I'm excited. We have some upcoming, we have this academic community I keep referring to. We have academic yeah. board meetings and those are coming up. So I'm excited to participate in those because we have trained the trainer program. So we have our own faculty who are training other faculty and really innovating around our solutions. Um, so that's that's really exciting. Um, this year really focused on working with our partners and customers who are in dire need um, for SAP talent. So just excited that there's all these opportunities for students um, and people who are just wanting to reskill. Um, our SAP um, learning organization also has released an opportunity for all really um, targeting, again, underserved communities, um, veterans, women who are coming back, returning to work. We have a yeah. um, return to work program, which is, is really exciting for women who have taken time off and are coming back to the workforce. So um, learn to earn programs. Um, and so just uh, looking across the world that we have all these amazing programs and, and scaling. How do we scale some of these great programs that we started in regions and then bringing, um, you know, to the masses. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, tons Thank of you. opportunities. 
it sounds like it. it sounds like creating a lot of opportunities for people as well, which is lovely. Yeah. That is actually a topic that is also on top of my mind. So uh, I am responsible for internal learning and development of our people, but obviously we have also academies that serve other audiences. We have around 30 learning bigger learning organizations and academies within Siemens. And um, we are trying to embark on, on other use cases on how to open up to broader audiences in a more strategic and, and tailored way because it's at the moment for us, it's still a bit fragmented. And I think there is a huge opportunity to use learning as a strategic and transformational lever for different audiences, you know, to, to bring broader education to societies, to students, to, to customers, whatever then the target audience is. I think in the program today, I saw you will have Tiru from Infosys uh, later in the mm -hmm. session. They have um, this, this great concept of their springboard platform where they work with many, many universities in India and make the learning freely available for the students of those universities. So I think there are really brilliant opportunities where, where we can all as a community um, really bring a lot of value to education um, and to society at large. Yeah, well, look, Thank you. I mean, I feel like we could we could go on we could go on for days. We could go on for hours. But for me, really, I've probably taken three things away from this. You know, in terms of what I've learned, kind of in in, in, in participating with you today, I think one the first one for me is to really see the outsized role that large organizations like yours have, not just on the responsibility to their employees, but responsibility to the wider ecosystem. In a way, responsibility to our wider communities as well. And I think you know, any business today, you know, really understands the outsized role that they have, you know, to be able to do that. I'm very grateful to see the passion that both of you bring to, to, to that responsibility. Um, so maybe that's the first, the first observation I have. The second one to me really is it sounds like you two have the same challenges that everybody does in terms of managing complexity, managing uncertainty, and finding a way to justify that ROI as well. So I'm glad to hear that we're not the only ones um, who are struggling with these challenges, um, but it's great to hear your perspectives and have been so valuable. But I think the third one, and the one that really excites me the most, is the fact that the two of you kept using the word opportunity when you were talking about what you're most excited about in the year ahead. And I think opportunity is so powerful, not just in terms of the opportunities you're bringing to your businesses, but the opportunities you're bringing to your employees, the opportunities you're bringing to maybe underserved and vulnerable populations, and the opportunities you're building, you're bringing to the wider world um, by living up to your purpose. So I'm really heartened by that. I'm really happy to hear that. And I hope the rest of our audience is as inspired as I've been by what you shared today and by your insights. So just before I wrap up and before I hand over to the next session, I just wanna say, Daniela, Karina, thank you both um, for a great panel discussion. Thank you for sharing your insights and your wisdom. I think we're all richer um, for having heard them today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so to our audience, thank you all. I really appreciate the engagement. The questions have been coming thick and fast. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them today, but we really, really appreciate the engagement. Um, our next session is about building enduring skill development into programs. And we'll talk about the Skills Compass report developed by Coursera and BGI. So thank you, everyone. Um, please stay with us. We've got a great day ahead. And I hope we set you all off with a great start today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.